I first encountered the music of Frederic Chopin, not through a piano recital or a sheet music anthology, but by playing a video game. 10 years ago, developer and director Hiroya Hatsushiba released the RPG Eternal Sonata with a unique premise. The events of the game's story take place entirely within Chopin's dream, as the composer lay dying in his Paris apartment from tuberculosis. In the dream, Chopin's influence as originator of the world is palpable. Heavily stylized characters and locations are whimsically named after musical instruments and terms, such as tuba, viola, allegretto, rondo, serenade, and even anachronistically, salsa and jazz. <laughs> However, nothing manifests this influence as completely as Chopin entering his own dream as playable main protagonist. Now, most of the Eternal Sonata's themes are drawn from biographical events in Chopin's life, forming a historical bedrock upon which the writers build the dream world's original story. First, Chopin's perceived identity as a romantic, consumptive artist marked him as occupying the boundary between life and death. Though he was doomed to premature death, Chopin's tuberculosis associated him with unique poetic insight, a pallid physical beauty, and a reputation as an artistic visionary. The latter was reinforced by his frequent nightmares and hallucinations documented in his Stuttgart diary and audiences interpreting his music as otherworldly. In the dream world, only the incurably, terminally ill can use magic, usually driving the user mad or transforming the user into a monster before death. The playable Chopin naturally is a magic user, consigning him to a grim fate in the dream world as well as in the real world. Another magic user is the second theme and the game's other main character, Polka, a 14-year-old girl based on Chopin's beloved younger sister, Amelia. At age 11, she began showing symptoms of recurrent coughing, breathlessness, weight loss, pneumonia, asthma, and recurrent hematemesis, which took her life at age 14. Even in the face of death, the luminous and angelic Amelia retained her kind-heartedness, accepting her fate with serenity. Likewise, Polka's potent magic portends terminal illness, yet she seeks to spend her time helping other people. Chopin's dream world relationship with his sister surrogate drives the primary development of both characters throughout the game. Chopin acts as an observer and a playable participant in the game's original plot. Now, though the original story of a ragtag group of young heroes rebelling against the corrupt tyrant Count Waltz is far less compelling than the broader story involving Chopin, it comprises a third point of resonance with Chopin's life. The rebel group Andantino parallels the November Uprising, which drove for independence in Warsaw, his home. As William Gibbons writes, by actively contributing to battle in his dream world, the metafictional Chopin engages with conflict in a direct way that the real composer never could. The game parallels Chopin's dream world flight to the neighboring country of Baroque with his expatriate exile in Vienna and Paris. Finally, Eternal Sonata foregrounds some of Chopin's pieces performed by internationally acclaimed pianist Stanislav Bunin through strategically placed intercuts that parallel Chopin's development and the story's events and themes, as you can see here. Gibbons points out that these intercuts comprise one of three distinct narrative levels, the real, the fictional, and the meta-fictional. The sound worlds of each level reify this structure. The meta-fictional dream world features Motoi Sakuraba's original score, the fictional scene of Chopin's deathbed in Paris contains only an ominously ticking clock, and the real biographical intercuts shift the focus to Chopin's life and music. Listen to this excerpt of the second intercut, featuring Chopin's revolutionary etude. <laughs>
Chopin's revolutionary etude is a critical cornerstone in interpreting a tonal sonata. Thus, an abbreviated semiotic analysis is warranted. Topically, the chromatic tempesta left-hand arpeggiation and pervasive dotted rhythms like martial trumpet calls denote a subject matter of armed conflict. Chopin composed the piece in the weeks following the news of the fall of Warsaw to Russia, so his inspiration is simple to infer. The opening features two motives. The right hand downward step to upward leap and playing an aggressive role, and the winding tempesta figure invoking chaos and anxiety, taking on an almost agential quality throughout the piece. The main melodic figure is the ascending stepwise motive, which I dub the revolution motive, expressing the greatest agential energy as it strives to overcome tonal gravity. With the exception of the coda, the etudes tonal events correspond to a tragic narrative archetype, which you can see highlighted here from Byron Allmain's A Theory of Musical Narrative. The initial negative order is firmly established through the Tempesta main introduction and C minor main theme. The secondary theme transitions in a powerful ascending gesture to a perfect authentic cadence in B-flat major. The revolution motive succeeds in breaking through the negative order to express itself as a heroic positive transgression. However, the tonicization of B-flat major is immediately subverted, re-establishing the negative order, which you can see there. The coda presents the piece's greatest analytical puzzle and most important hermeneutic window. After a definitive perfect authentic cadence in C minor, the melody rises to E natural, borrowed from the parallel major. Could this be a Picardy third, suggesting the bestowal of a positive outcome by grace in a tragic to transcendent archetype? Previous passages had hinted at ambiguities of major versus minor mode. However, the transposed tempesta motive reinterprets the implied C major as a 5-7 of 4, thus denoting modulation to a new key in F. The final bell-like proclamatory chords thus form a modulating half cadence, but the piece cuts off abruptly, and as this is the final etude in the book, the entire opus 10 ends tonally unstable. In the revolutionary etude, Chopin grapples with hope and despair in the chaos of war. Its tragic narrative snuffs out the brief sliver of hope attained by the revolution motive, reminiscent of the events of the November uprising. Yet he leaves the ultimate outcome open-ended and indeterminate in the coda, hinting at a Picardy third revolution that could only be achieved by defying conventional musical logic. This move, however, remains inconclusive. Only injecting something new can break the cycle of war. The game's themes and music culminate in its final act, set in the ethereal realm of elegy, where the souls of magic users who have succumbed to disease are trapped in a state between life and death as Chopin is in the real world. After the expected defeat of Count Waltz, Chopin himself faces Polka and the party as the game's true final battle. Sakuraba's track, Rebuilding Ourselves, seems as if Chopin is forcibly imposing his own music onto the metafictional sound world. The track orchestrates the C minor introduction and main theme of the revolutionary etude, the negative order, nearly verbatim. This time, however, there is no breakthrough to a B-flat major cadence, but an original secondary theme deriving from Sakuraba rather than Chopin that constitutes a stronger positive transgression through deceptive resolution to the, relative, or to the major six key area, A-flat major. The harmony then oscillates between Chopin's C minor and Sakuraba's A-flat major, orally representing the collision of sound worlds vying for control. The secondary theme returns in a corrupted form, now recontextualized over a C minor to C fully diminished seventh progression taken from measures 13 to 14 of the etude. 
the transgression, the positive transgression is subsumed to, Cho to Chopin's negative order. A developmental theme based on the etude's aggressive motive and a quotation of the tempesta motive steer towards a return of the main theme, thus solidifying the negative outcome. Gibbons believes that the cognitive dissonance brought about by the Chopin and Sakuraba intertext is minimized by both its scarcity and its narrative justification. However, interjections in the music serve to maximize its schizophrenic nature, obliterating the melos with chaotic gestures reminiscent of a psychological breakdown, suggesting a fracturing of the music's virtual subjectivity. Because of the looping inherent in battle tracks, rebuilding ourselves is caught in a continual tragic arc without the potential escape offered in the Etudes Coda, reflecting the cyclical destruction of the dream world. Rather than minimizing conflict, these thematic parallels augment and foreground it. Soon, the defeated composer falls, expecting to die and the dream world to fade. However, the fantasy remains, largely in ruins due to the dark energy released from Elegy by Count Waltz. Polka realizes that only her magic can purge the sea of darkness and jumps off a cliff to sacrifice herself. To his and everybody's surprise, Chopin awakens to see in horror that Polka has died, despite his efforts to prevent her fate by ending the dream. The scene cuts to Paris, where the doctor announces Chopin's death at 2 a.m. In the dream world, Chopin's disembodied voice declares that Polka, as a 14-year-old girl, must live. And she is raised from the cliff and reunited with the party. When she sets foot on the ground, all life is restored to the metafictional world. The final scene confounds many players and receives no mention in Gibbons' treatment, yet prov provides a key to understanding the game's entire ending. At his Paris deathbed, Chopin's spirit rises out of his body and begins to play his beloved play al piano. Polish countess Delfina Potaka, a friend and piano student of Chopin's, begins to sing to his accompaniment. The song is Sakuraba's Kyo Tenka, which forms another inner text with Chopin's music, this time with the raindrop pre prelude in D-flat major, the first of his pieces heard in game. Gyotenka features a repeated A-flat-3 in the piano, precisely the same note and register of the prelude's signature feature. Importantly, Kiyotenka is in A flat major, picking up the key from the positive transgression of rebuilding ourselves. This connection is reinforced by the introductory motive, outlining the same notes as the melody of Sakuraba's original secondary theme, the positive transgression. The element previously corrupted and subsumed has now been accepted and incorporated into Chopin's own playing. In the latter half of the track, Sakuraba's orchestra redirects the leader style to conclude in his own characteristically epic style. In this intertextual tale of two composers, Chopin has passed the musical torch to Sakuraba. Now what light does semiotic analysis of Eternal Sonata's score shed on the artistic meaning of its complex and multiply ambiguous ending? 
As befits a story taking place in the mind of a musician, the marked intertextual relationships between Chopin's and Sakuraba's music serve as a hermeneutic key to decoding the, pieces, uh, the game's thematic meaning. A key concept is that of intertextuality. Michael Klein, in his account of intertextuality, makes the daring and provocative claim that intertextuality actually enables a later text to impact the meaning of earlier ones, an outrageously ontological claim that he, of backwards causation that he dubs transhistorical intertextuality. To appropriate and rephrase Klein, the relationships between the text and these inner texts is dynamically bilateral. Not only does Chopin help us interpret Eternal Sonata and Sakuraba, but Sakuraba and Eternal Sonata help us interpret Chopin as well. Eternal Sonata's metafictional plotline forms a backwards causation inner text with the events of Chopin's life. Though the story's themes originate in sign complexes drawn from Chopin's life, they are instantiated beyond him, addressing modern themes of environmentalism, suicide, abuse of addicted substances and technology, and more. Chopin lives on in his music through the backwards causation intertext formed with the revolutionary etude through Sakuraba's rebuilding ourselves. The revolutionary etude, caught in a tragic cycle, only hinting at a potential escape, forms the basis for future musical productivity when Sakuraba's new secondary theme is added, leading eventually to the hopeful resolution in Kiyotenka. Chopin's pieces performed in the intercuts by Bunin are ossified in past history, essential and informative, yet stagnant. As Klein writes via Umberto Eco, signs are dead in isolation, but come to life within their use of an ecology of signs. A second theme is the acceptance of death. In the final battle, the creator confronts his creation directly. If Chopin the creator wins, he awakens in Paris alone to find that his creations are no more. He has reasserted his artistic authority, but at the loss of the art. However, by letting go and sacrificing his life, Chopin, um, he can break the egoistic cycle that ensnared his etude and the dream world. Paradoxically, Chopin must let go of his memory of Amelia, ossified as a terminally ill girl who can never live beyond 14, so that she may live on as Polka in the metafictional world. As Chopin declares before reviving Polka, death is a reality that is far too real. But I walk this dream-like journey within a dream so that once and for all, I could accept it. This is the message and unifying theme of Eternal Sonata, the ongoing existence, the eternal life of the artist, enabled by liberation of the art from the artist's mind. The dream world, though originating in Chopin's life and music, is revitalized by Chopin's sacrifice as an inner text imbued with the creative intentions of the game developers, existing even after the mind that conceived it has died. Chopin lives on through his music, taken up to be performed and used by others like Hotaka and Sakuraba. This is the meaning of that puzzling final scene. The art lives on through liberation from the artist, which Chopin comes to accept by accompanying Potaka, passing the musical torch to Sakuraba's original themes and orchestrations. As Klein writes, if we listen to Chopin again and again, if we are drawn to understand some new detail previously overlooked, Chopin's dreams become our dreams. Eternal Sonata is an exegesis of near-death experience, the dynamic struggle between grasping to control one's own legacy and letting go to leave it in the hands of others, trusting that they will be faithful and faithfully creative to one's beloved art. Thank you. <laughs>